Welcome to the captivating journey into the enigmatic world of the Hellfire Club, a clandestine and scandalous society that thrived in the 18th century Britain and Ireland. In this video, I will unveil the intriguing history and explore the dark secrets surrounding this notorious organization. The Hellfire Club, famously founded by Sir Francis Dashwood, stands as a testament in an era of excess, decadence, and rebellion against societal norms. In the midst of the 18th century, the Hellfire Club was a haven for the elite, a place where aristocrats and influential figures gathered to indulge in their wildest desires. It was a realm of debauchery, secrecy, and unabashed hedonism, where members engaged in heavy drinking, reckless gambling, and unbridled libertine behavior. Yet, what truly set the Hellfire Club apart was its penchant for audacious, sometimes blasphemous mock religious rituals and ceremonies. These gatherings took place in the most remote and secluded locations, often deep within the country estates or hidden within eerie caves, adding an air of mystique and exclusivity to their already scandalous reputation. These rituals were designed to shock and challenge the prevailing moral and religious standards of the time, pushing the boundaries of societal acceptance. As I embark on this exploration, I will delve into the origins of the Hellfire Club, the identities of its notorious members, and the controversies that surround it. In the 18th century, Britain and Ireland underwent a profound transformation, marked by sweeping social, political, and intellectual changes. To understand the intriguing world of the Hellfire Club, it's crucial to delve into the historical context of the time. The 18th century was a period of monumental shifts in society. It witnessed significant events like the American Revolution and the nascent Industrial Revolution that were reshaping the world. Society in Britain and Ireland during this era was structured hierarchically, with the aristocracy wielding considerable power and privilege. The prevailing moral and religious norms were deeply rooted in the Church of England, shaping societal expectations. The Enlightenment, a profound intellectual movement of the time, celebrated the values of reason, individualism, and secularism. These Enlightenment ideals challenged traditional authority and provided fertile ground for new ways of thinking about morality, religion, and society. Within the religious landscape of the 18th century, the Church of England held a dominant position. However, dissenting religious groups and tensions existed, contributing to the religious diversity of the period. As we explore the Hellfire Club's history, keep in mind this dynamic historical context. It sheds light on why the club emerged when it did and how it represented a response to the changing tides of the 18th century Britain and Ireland. Now, let's journey further into the birth of the Hellfire Club in its early days. Sir Francis Dashwood was born in the year December 1708 in Great Marlborough Street, London. He was the only son of Sir Francis Dashwood, 1st Baronet, and Mary, the eldest daughter of Verfan, 4th Earl of Westmoreland. Sir Francis Dashwood and Mary had two children, Francis and Rachel, while Sir Francis had additional children from his first and third marriages. Francis Dashwood received his education at Eton College, where he became associated with William Pitt the Elder. Unfortunately, at the age of 15, he inherited his father's estates of West Wycombe upon his father's death in 1724. In 1732, Dashwood established a dining club known as the Society of Dilettantes, comprised of around 40 members who had developed an appreciation for classical art during their travels. He played a leading role in society and was painted by George Napton in 1742. Dashwood was elected as the Arch Master of Society in 1746, and he presented various petitions from the Dialon Society to King George II in his search for a permanent location. Despite its initially lighthearted nature, the Dialon Society evolved into a more serious institution, leading to Dashwood's election as a Fellow of the Royal Society in June 1746 and a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London in June 1769. He also became involved in various other organizations, including the Lincoln Club and the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers, and Commerce, and had a connections with the Spalding Society. He served as Vice President of the Foundling Hospital and the General Medical Asylum. In collaboration with John Motagu, 
Dashwood founded the Divan Club in 1744, intended for those who had visited the Ottoman Empire to share their experiences. However, this club disbanded after two years. Dashwood also ventured into politics upon his return to England, securing a minor post in the household of Frederick Lewis, Prince of Wales. He actively opposed Robert Walpole's administration, fighting against Walpole's supporters during the general election of 1741 and securing a seat in Parliament for himself. Dashwood remained a staunch opponent of George II's governments. In 1747, Dashwood introduced a poor relief bill that suggested commissioning public works, including the Hellfire Caves later excavated at West Wycombe Park to combat unemployment. The bill did not pass. He was re-elected for New Romney in 1747 and disavowed Jacobitism in January 1751. Dashwood supported the influence of George Doddington and opposed the Regency Bill on the 15th of May 1751. He was awarded a Doctor of Civil Law degree by Oxford University in 1749 and became a fellow member of the Royal Society in 1746. In the spring of 1721, an anonymous shadow fell over London as the London Gazette detailed the government's determined efforts to suppress the sinister deeds of a select group of youthful individuals, compromising both men and women, hailing from the upper echelons of society. Their shockingly irreverent conduct was believed to be sowing the seeds of moral chaos and posing a dire threat to the very foundation of society. While not explicitly mentioned by name, the principal focus of King and the government's measures was unmistakably directed at the infamous Hellfire Club. Once the activities of these clubs came to light, a combination of moral panic and voyeuristic curiosity spread like wildfire. The burgeoning press of the early 18th century, fueled by the proliferation of coffee houses and social clubs, ensured that newspapers were widely circulated, read aloud to those who couldn't read, and thoroughly discussed. The revelation of a blasphemous secret society or club thriving amidst the elite of London's high society created an absolute sensation. People clamor for every tidbit of information regarding the club's members and their deeds. There were even rumors circulating that one of the Queen's ladies in waiting was a member, prompting King George I to launch an investigation within his household. The club was rumored to have convened in various locations, including Westminster, Conduit Street, and Somerset House. An illustration published in 1721 in the pamphlet titled The Hellfire Club, kept by a society of blasphemers, depicted an image gathering of the Somerset House Hellfire Club. According to reports from Appleby's Journal, which emerged after the club's activities became public knowledge, the Hellfire Club consisted of approximately 40 individuals, scandalously including 15 women of high social standing. Members would habitually dress as biblical characters, adopting the names of patriarchs, all in an attempt to mock Christianity. They partook in a concoction known as Hellfire Punch and indulged in meals with names like Holy Ghost Pie, Devil's Loins, and Breast of Venus. It was even claimed that if a member passed away, they would be appointed as the club's ambassador in hell. One can easily envision Appleby's journal as the equivalent of today's Daily Mail, leaving its predominantly respectable readers both scandalized and captivated by these scandalous antics. The Hellfire Club faced its most damning accusation, the mockery of the Holy Trinity, Indulging in Holy Ghost pie while clad as patriarchs and engaging in amorous encounters with the Lady Hellfire was a surefire way to drive the establishment into a frenzy. As Miss Weekly Journal noted on February 20th, 1720, the Hellfire Club displayed a transcendent malignity, ridiculing religious forms as mere trifles. They seemed to progress naturally from derision to substance, aligning themselves with Lucifer and their assault on divinity. The journal even claimed that ladies shielded their faces from the perceived whiff of brimstone when passing by the club's members. Concrete, 
Reliable evidence regarding the club's activities remains exceedingly scarce. As Evelyn Lohr points out in her book, quote, The Hellfire Clubs, Sex, Satanism, and Secret Societies, most of the alleged activities mentioned above only surfaced in journals long after the club's existence had been exposed. Even in these sensationalized and tabloid-like accounts, there is limited evidence of actual devil worship primarily involving toasting the devil and engaging in general misbehavior. So why did the Hellfire Clubs acquire a reputation for satanic practices? The answer appears to reside in the perspective of Bishop Wake, who played a role in drafting the bill against the Hellfire Club. His primary objective was to uphold Anglican orthodoxy in the settlement of 1688. In the face of the rising Jacobitism and perceived Catholic threat following the failed Jacobite uprising in 1715, he firmly believed that anyone who denied the Trinity must, by default, be in league with the devil. Consequently, the Hellfire Club's activities were not only deemed blasphemous but effectively labeled as satanic as well. However, it seems there may have been more to the suppression of the Hellfire Club than merely safeguarding the state religion and preserving the nation's morals. Introducing Philip, Duke of Wharton, a figure characterized by his brilliance, charm, and charisma, and an unapologetically rebellious and debauched lifestyle, earning him the titles of Rake Hell and Libertine Extraordinaire. Even the usually dyspeptic Alexander Pope described him as the scorn and wonder of our days. Philip, born in the year 1698, was the grandson of an unlikely figure, a Puritan, and the son of the author of the Lily Berlaro. With his mother Lucy Loftus being a woman renowned for her beauty and celebrated at the famous Kit Kat Club. His upbringing was nothing short of rigorous, encompassing a wide array of subjects from mathematics to metaphysics, classics to Shakespeare. He exhibited a remarkable aptitude for languages and a talent for mimicry. Originally destined for a promising career in statesmanship, his family was aghast when, at the tender age of 17, he eloped with the daughter of a penniless major general. Rumors even circulated that his father was so distraught over the irrevocable marriage that he passed away mere weeks later. While undoubtedly a somber event, it left the way where Air emancipated from parental control. In a bid to rein in the unruly heir, he was dispatched by his trustees on a grand tour of the continent. However, instead of visiting the typical destinations where wherever it could be expected, such as France and Italy, he found himself in the austere Protestant territories of Holland, Hanover, and Geneva. This uninspiring itinerary didn't sit well with the wayward duke who promptly abandoned his tutors in Geneva in the year 1716 and made a beeline for Paris, the epicenter of sophistication and the heart of the Jacobite court in exile. An anecdote from this time involving his encounter with a Jacobite exile named Gwen paints a vivid picture of his already audacious personality as he playfully quipped about descending to hell and inviting Gwen to join him as the devil's lord of the bedchamber. After various escapades with the Jacobite court in exile, including a meeting with the old pretender himself, Philip eventually returned to England via Ireland. Perhaps concerned about this influential figure's Jacobite leanings, George I conferred a dukedom upon Philip in the year 1718 and what may have been an attempt to secure his loyalty. However, George's hopes were dashed as Philip, now a statesman, emerged as a vocal critic of Robert Walpole, the de facto Prime Minister of England and representative of Whig Party interest. In his opposition to Walpole and the Whig Party's political dominance, Geoffrey Ashe, in his book The Hellfire Clubs, credits Philip with political significance as one of the first to challenge the Whig stranglehold on 18th century politics and patronage. Given his unconventional and rebellious nature, it's no surprise that Philip was the mastermind and founding member of the original Hellfire Club. As mentioned earlier, clubs were all the rage in the sociable 18th century, and not all of them adhered to the standards of respectability upheld by the Kit Kat Club. In 1712, the Mohawks, a gang of gentlemen, terrorized London with their violent antics, and Daniel Defoe wrote of a poem, Pagan Circle, near Old Charing Cross, where God was both revere and blaspheme in the same breath. Wharton is believed to have initiated the Hellfire Club sometime in 1720. Evelyn Lord notes that around the same time, Wharton's son passed away. He separated from his wife, 
and began associating with the rather unsavory Colonel Charteris, aptly nicknamed the Rape Master General. It's possible that the two of them conceived the Hellfire Club as the ultimate act of rebellion against the increasingly staid and mercantile respectability promoted by the Georgian society. Among the rumored members were Viscount Hillsborough and Sir Edmund O'Brien, with speculation even suggesting that the famous Lady Mary Wortley Montagu might have been associated with the club. It's worth noting that Lady Mary and Wharton became friends in the year 1722, a year after the Hellfire Club disbanded when Wharton was residing in Twickenham. Lady Mary later wrote about a different club called the Schemers, an orgiastic club established by Lord Hillsborough, and this reference became intertwined with that of the Hellfire Club. Her friendship with the scandalous Duke only added to the intrigue, linking her name to the Hellfire Club. Philip, Duke of Warden's Hellfire Club, was undoubtedly a reflection of his audacious spirit and penchant for challenging societal norms. It served as a provocative counterpoint to the growing conformity of Georgian society, where mercantile respectability was increasingly prized. This enigmatic club, with its mysterious rituals and debauched gatherings, became both a symbol of rebellion and a source of fascination for many. While the details of its activities remain shrouded in mystery and the extent of its actual devilish practices is debatable, the Hellfire Club and its enigmatic founder, Philip Wharton, Duke of Wharton, have left an indelible mark on the annals of history, embodying the spirit of defiance and nonconformity of the 18th century. Dashwood was known for his rebellious nature, and there's a legend that he once impersonated the monarch, Charles XII, while attempting to seduce Tsarina Anne during his time in Russia. Inspired by the Duke of Wharton, Dashwood had a vision for a unique club that would eventually become famous as the Hellfire Club. Later, the club's name was slightly altered to become the Order of the Knights of St. Francis. Membership in this club grew rapidly, and a larger venue was required. Dashwood found a suitable location in the rooms of Cistercian Abbey in West Wycombe, located six miles from his home. This location was remote enough to ensure secrecy and privacy for the club's activities. The abbey was in a state of disrepair, with only a few columns and walls remaining. Dashwood made some additions, including a cloister with half a dozen arches and a new tower. Underneath the abbey, he had a series of caves carved out which were decorated with mythological themes, phallic symbols, and other sexually suggestive items, giving the club a somewhat eccentric character. The Hellfire Club's meetings were held biannually, and attendees received invitations from the prior. Costumes were required for these gatherings, and they were documented in a book called Nocturnal Revels in the year 1779. The meetings were known for their indulgence in food, wine, and the company of cheerful ladies of lively dispositions. These rituals often featured a strong emphasis on sexual and hedonistic elements, and even the club's garden featured structures like the Temple of Venus and Parlor of Venus, as well as statues of Pan and Priapus, all of which emphasized themes related to divine procreation. The club has some famous members, including John Wilkes, whose political conflicts with the founding member, the Earl of Sandwich, exposed the club's activities to public scrutiny and contributed to its notoriety. Other notable members included Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the USA who was known for his interest in a glass harmonica, Chevalier Dion, a sexually ambiguous cross-dressing French spy, and George Selwyn, an 18th century individual with a macabre reputation as in gentleman sadist. There were also mostly, there were also famous female members with Lady Mary Wortley Montagu being one of the most distinguished among them. The government's apprehension concerning clubs like the Hellfire Club stemmed from the potential they held as breeding grounds for sedition. England in the early 18th century was far from the idyllic world portrayed in Fielding's Tom Jones. Since the glorious revolution of 1688, when the Protestant William of Orange had replaced the Catholic James II, the Anglicans had been on edge. The government sought a compliant clergy, one that didn't aspire to Catholic-style priestly intercessions with the divine. Consequently, in the year 1717, the convocation of the Church of England, which favored this view, was suspended, leaving the remaining clergy as pliable yes-men. Nonetheless, upholding the illusion of their moral authority remained crucial to the establishment, particularly in the wake of the failed Jacobite rebellion of the year 1715. Furthermore, 
The calamitous South Sea bubble speculation, which left everyone from dukes to housemaids bankrupt, cast a shadow over the stability of early Georgian society. Many genuinely believed that the nation was facing divine retribution. Thus, in the public's eye, the existence of a society of blasphemous devil worshippers in the heart of the capital may have been perceived as a symptom of the nation's declining moral fabric and a provocation to divine anger. The government could ill afford to allow potentially seditious secret societies like the Hellfire Club, led by a suspected Jacobite sympathizer, to flourish unchecked. Such organizations were viewed as potential catalysts for political unrest and moral disorder. When you factor in the personal animosity between Wharton and Walpole, the prime architect of the act designed to suppress such clubs, it becomes evident that the Hellfire Club's days were numbered. Furthermore, the context of the times was one of deep-seated political and religious tensions. The memory of the tumultuous steward era, marked by religious strife, civil wars, and regicide still loomed large. The glorious revolution of the year 1688 had brought a Protestant monarchy to the forefront, but it had not entirely quelled fears of Catholic resurgence or Jacobite uprisings. The government, led by Prime Minister Robert Walpole, aimed to maintain a delicate balance between religious factions and political stability. In this charged atmosphere, the perceived threat posed by clubs like the Hellfire Club, with their irreverent and potentially subversive activities, was a cause for significant concern. Suppressing such gatherings was seen as a way to safeguard both the religious and political status quo. The original Hellfire Club, which had a brief existence lasting less than a year, met its demise by the year 1721. It was officially banned by the Act of Parliament, although intriguingly, no prosecutions ever took place. The Duke of Wharton, its flamboyant founder, eventually departed England and met a debt-ridden end at the remarkably young age of 33, concluding an uneventful exile. He would later be immortalized as the anti-hero Love Lance in Samuel Richardson's novel, Clarissa Harlow. However, the Hellfire Club did not fade into obscurity. In addition to the Grub Street hacks who played a significant role in creating its infamous reputation, many respectable individuals documented in their memoirs. Notable figures like Miss Delaney and William Winston recounted their encounters with it. Moreover, the club gave rise to numerous other Hellfire groups, particularly in Ireland, where Wharton has spent some time and even managed to charm the notoriously misanthropic Dean Swift of Gulliver's Travels fame. Many of these Irish clubs cultivated an even more pronounced satanic reputation than Wharton's group of blasphemers. A curious legacy of the original Hellfire Club was Wharton's bequest in his will, leaving the remnants of his estate to George Doddington, Lord Treasurer. Bub Doddington would later gain notoriety through his association with perhaps the most renowned Hellfire Club of them all, the Monks of Medenham. However, that tale deserved its own day for storytelling.